give me messages to give to Washington. So I know everything. Every single conversation is going through me. And I can tell you that in April of 2001, I was summoned to my CIA handler, Dr. Richard Fuse, and he said he had a message for me to deliver to New York at the earliest possible convenience. And the message was this. We are looking for information on a conspiracy to hijack airplanes. We expect the target to be the World Trade Center. We think they're going to fly the airplanes into the World Trade Center. And uh, we want the Iraqis to provide any, it's called actionable intelligence. Actionable intelligence is a name, an airport hub, a flight number, something that's going to help us identify who they are, where they're meeting, who, what their nationalities are, anything like this. And he says, he gives me a message and he says, we want this information and I want you to tell the Iraqis that if they fail to give us this information and if it is later determined that they knew the information and they did not give it to us, then the United States is prepared to go to war with Iraq. Okay, this is April of 2001. Well, I went up to, to New York and I was very, we were in the middle of these great negotiations. We already had an invite, we, from February of 2001, we had an invitation for the FBI to come to Baghdad. So I go up to New York, I'm very pleasant, I'm very polite. There's no reason to be nasty with these people, they want peace. I say, hey, could you please send a message to Baghdad? We'd like this information. If you come across anything, you know, you've all, Saddam had been one of our best sources on terrorism throughout the 1990s. Iraq hated terrorism because they believed that, um, they hated Islamic jihadis. He hate, I mean, he did, he, whether you like Saddam or not, whether you hate Saddam or not, he hated Islamic conservatives. He was convinced that they would take advantage of the, uh, the crumbling of authority in Baghdad under the sanctions and that they would then uh, try to overthrow, overturn his government and the poverty of the people from the, the sanctions would, would fuel this, this problem, would, would help overturn his government. So he wanted to help us at every turn keep these people fr you know, from, from becoming too powerful. Okay, and so we knew this. So when I go to New York in April of 2001, I'm very friendly and I say, hey look, you, could you send the message to Baghdad? Let them know we're looking for this, thanks. And the message from the Iraqis in April of 2001 is, hey, send the FBI. We've already agreed to send the, you can, we've already invited you to send the FBI, come on. Tell them, just bring them on, sure. Wow, you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> okay, so I go back to, Rich, I go back to, to Washington and I get a phone call from Richard. He said, come down, come down to my office. I want to hear what they said. I go down, I said, oh, I was real polite. I, yeah, yeah, you know, I gave him the message, sure, sure. He said, I didn't tell you to be nice. I told you to tell those, you, this is going to be on television, right? This is going to be like, okay, well, we'll be, well, I'll, I'll, I'll soft pedal what he said. He was like, you, t you go back to, you stupid goddamn blankety, 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 blankety. I told you to tell those SOB, MFers, God, GD, blah, 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 screaming, circling me around his conference. I can, I'll never forget it. Circling his conference desk, ranting and raving, waving his arms around. He didn't do that very often. He's, he does not have that kind of personality. He's a very calm man and he feels that if you're, if you're really angry at somebody, then the more calm you are, the more dangerous you are. That's CIA. He's old school CIA. Okay, so he's screaming now. And I go back, he's like, you go back to New York and you deliver the message exactly the way that I told you to deliver the message. And I said, well, Richard, I don't want them to think I'm threatening them because, you know, I'm a, I believe in like negotiations and conflict resolution. He said, no, no, I don't want them to think you are threatening them. And he said, I don't want them to think I am threatening them. I want you to tell them this threat of war originates at the highest level of government above the CIA director and above the Secretary of State, that it would be three men, President George Bush, Vice President Dick Cheney, and Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, and no one else. Those are the three people who are threatening war. And I want to be really clear about the message that I was ordered to give them. 
We demand that you turn over any actionable, any fragment of intelligence outlining a, a, a conspiracy involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center. If you withhold this information, if we discover that you have withheld this information and the attack occurs, then we will bomb you back to the Stone Age. You will be bombed harder than you've ever been bombed before. You will be destroyed. You cannot, you've never been hit the way we're going to hit you now. Okay, so, okay, so I went up and I delivered that message. This is May of 2001. In June and July, practically every single week, my CIA handler, Dr. Richard Fuse, and I talked about 9-11. And it was very clear that the intelligence community was being prepped for two things. One, to expect airplane hijackings. Now, I have to be honest with you, because I know a lot of you are interested in the controlled demolition. They prepped us to expect the airplane hijackings. They told us about it. They tried, they demand, like my CIA handler demanded that Iraq had to give us this. And they, they d insisted that if, they, if it happened, there would, be a, there would be dire consequences. Now, what you're going to see in my book, and I, we have more copies of my book outside. We can, we've got more, or more here, too. Um, that the... the, the there was something else going on that summer that was really beautiful. This peace framework that we had been working on was, was magnificent. It was turning out just glorious for a peace dividend. The Iraqis were now offering the weapons inspections, which of course we, that we, the United States had very rigorous standards for the weapons inspections. Iraq was offering cooperation with anti-terrorism to allow the FBI to go in. And Iraq started to offer a lot more. A lot more came on the table. By the summer, by June and July of 2001, Iraq was offering the United States preferential contract. And I think about the economy today. Preferential contracts for the United States corporations on telecommunications, healthcare, hospital equipment, pharmaceuticals, transportation. Iraq offered to buy one million American manufactured automobiles every year for 10 years. Think of what that would have done to the economy. Think about non-dual use factory production. And all of this was because the CIA was like, you know, if we're going to give up these darn sanctions, we're going we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna to take a pound of flesh with it. They had no, you know, and whether you like the CIA or not, and most of you, 99% of you don't like the CIA. I realize that, of course. But the CIA was doing what it's supposed to do, whether you like it or not. They were taking care of what is in the best interest of the United States government, with the best interest of the United States economy, and they were not going to let Iraq punish the United States. And I hated the sanctions. I was doing this because I hated the sanctions. I was doing it because I thought because they had destroyed education. They wiped out literacy in a single generation. They destroyed the hospitals and the healthcare system. Iraq performed the second heart transplant in the world, and we wiped them out. Okay, uh, 11,000 people died every month. By the end of 1996, 500,000 children had died of sanctions, and they only counted five-year-olds and younger. They didn't even count the six-year-olds because the United Nations was holding back the numbers. And after that report in, at the, in December of 96, they stopped counting it. They, the United Nations never published another report on the deaths. So frequently what you will hear is that only 500,000 children died, but in fact they continued to die, and approximately one million children died. They were babies. What did, they weren't even alive when the first Gulf War happened. This was an offense against, you know, this is genocide. This is a mass genocide. So that's my motivation. But the CIA did not have my motivation. They were out to make sure that the United States was not going to be punished for what they had done. And I was like, and, and believe me, by this point, we just wanted to get rid of the sanctions. The Iraqis were like, if they'll get rid of the sanctions, you bet. We'll give them anything they want. So before 9-11, you could have had every single thing you possibly could dream of. And if the CIA could have thought of more to ask for, we would have. We would have asked for, it was shameless. Okay, so, so you have peace that's breaking out in the Middle East. You have the 9-11 warnings. And then in August of 2001, uh, we went into high mode, high activity mode. On all, I can tell you the exact day, uh, on August 2nd, 
and after I tell you this, I'll open it up to questions. Um, on August 2nd was the uh, Senate nomination hearings for Robert Mueller who, to head the FBI. He was going to be the FBI director. And I was on the phone with my CIA handler, Richard Fuse, and I said, there's not one single terrorism investigation this man hasn't thrown. He, oops. <laughs> That's okay. He threw the nine, he threw the Oklahoma City bombing investigation. He threw Lockerbie. And I said, this man should not be the FBI director when this next attack occurs. And Richard Fuse said to me, my God, what if there is no FBI director when this happens? I said, do you think it's that soon? Do you think the attack is imminent? He said, oh, yeah. He said, it's absolutely just in the next couple of weeks. He said, this is, he said, I don't want, and I said, well, God, Richard, I'll go back to New York right now, and I'll get, I'll pump the Iraqis and see if they've got anything from Baghdad. I'll see if they have any news for us. And he said, oh, my God, Susan, don't go back to, do not go back to New York City. It's too dangerous. We are expecting a, the use of a miniature thermonuclear device. And they were not afraid that I was going to be hurt by like falling debris in the World Trade Center. I wasn't going to be at the World Trade Center. They were afraid of radiation contamination, like the winds blowing the radio radioactive stuff. And that's what they, he was like, don't go up there. We're expecting mass casualties. And I said, well, Richard, you know, I'll go up the, you know, the day after. This was a, I can tell you the exact day. It was a Thursday. And I said, I will go up to New York on Saturday, and I'll report to you on Monday, and we'll just find out if the Iraqis have anything to give us. I went up to New York. The Iraqis said, ain't got nothing. We don't know. We don't know anything about this. You keep telling us about this. The only way we know about it is because you're talking about it. But we don't have any information to give you. And if we did, we understand the consequences. We know that if we don't help you, you're going to go to war with us if you think we did. And we, if there was anything we could give you, we would do it. So I go back and I report that on August 6th. On August 6th, there is a memo to the president telling him that th this is a high security threat, that it is an emergency level, that it's imminent. OK. I, at my meeting with Richard Fuse, Richard Fuse tells, does something very important. He tells me that because of my direct contacts with Iraq and Libya, I should be the one, I am perfectly positioned, because everyone likes to think that Iraq and Libya are involved in terrorism to begin with, I should be the one to contact U.S. Attorney General John Ashcroft's office. And I should tell them that we're looking for an emer what's called an emergency broadcast alert across all agencies seeking any fragment of intelligence involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center identified specifically. And I, call, I make that phone call. Uh, that, that con my conversation was refused is August 6th. Probably August 7th, August 8th, I call them. And immediately I talk to the, pri I have a private phone number. See, huh, you guys couldn't get this number, but I have it, OK? I have the number inside the Attorney General's office. I'm not calling a switchboard. I'm calling his private staff, OK? I'm calling his, like, his, his government liaison office. His, his, you know, no, no, let me, no, that's not true. I call his private internal office. There are about 20 members of his private staff. His legislative director is there. His government relations person is there. But I call inside that office. And they give me the, office for the, the phone number for the Office of Counterterrorism. They say, repeat exactly what you just told us and tell them. I am told that John Ashcroft said, oh, those CIA people keep talking about terrorism. And they keep talking about this darn airplane hijacking. And they're so paranoid. And why do they keep bugging us about it? That's what I'm told they said. <laughs> uh, but I did what I did. And when I did that, I apparently tripped some wires. Because it denied the White House, it denied the Justice Department and the Attorney General's office of deniability, plausible deniability. And that's very important. And that is why they came after me so hard and tried to destroy me utterly, because they could not admit to you that we had